So let's, let's start a little bit. Uh, I've just made a few notes to myself. Let me start with a couple of things. Uh, let me start off. How many of you want to be leaders? How many of you do not? OK, good. At least we've got a couple. All right, that's positive. All right, so let me start with, here's what I'm going to try to talk about here today, is allow you to take all this chaos and all these worries and make them a little more manageable, OK? So, so you don't have 78 things to worry about, but maybe there are two or three or four. And I know the two weeks you're spending here are intended to narrow this down, right? OK, so let me start with a few basics. And then we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll just talk. How's that? Uh, let me start with what leadership is. Because most of you want to succeed as leaders. Yes? Um, leadership, let me start with, is not, in my opinion, is not about outcomes. Okay? So here's what, here's what I mean. Uh, you know, I was at, you heard I was on Wall Street for 23 years, right? So, that, and everybody, that, that was a great career. I love my career. I go do this weird thing. I go teach for a semester at Harvard Business School Leadership. People thought it was bizarre. My mom thought I'd lost my mind. Uh, everybody thought it was a terrible idea. And then I went and quit and stayed uh, to teach leadership because I thought I could make a bigger impact on the world doing that. OK, so fine. So now I've been doing it for long enough, and I became an instructor, then a professor. So I go around, sometimes I'll go out, I'm from Kansas City, and I'll talk to friends and family, or I'll go somewhere and, and people say, what do you do? Or they'll hear and they'll say, boy, I hear you're a professor at Harvard Business School. Or I'll tell them and they'll think that's pretty cool. What a change, that's a great thing you're doing. Then I'll ask them, then they'll ask me what I teach, okay? And I tell them I teach leadership. The reaction is kind of, uh, what's that? I mean, what, what, that's weird. I mean, I don't think you can teach that. Can you teach that? I don't think you can teach that. Uh, how do you teach that? What is that? So what I've learned is, after about a thousand of these conversations over and over and over again, where I'd go like, uh, you know, I left Wall Street to teach a subject that nobody thinks you can even teach or learn. Uh, I've tried to spend the last six or seven years demystifying what leadership is. Here's the problem. Everyone, including CEOs or governors, and certainly you, has a different definition of what a leader does. OK? And we've, we've gotten a little bit sensed by your fears. We got a little sense of that. Uh, a lot of people think leadership is about being liked and, uh, and inspiring others, right? And some of you may worry that you're not going to be accepted and you won't be able to inspire and lead up and cause others to follow you, right? Some of you worry that about results. A lot of people think that leadership is about results. The industry I worked in, I can assure you, if you're making a lot of money, you look like a lot better leader. And if you're losing money, you look like an idiot, no matter how good a leader you are. And a lot of you are worried you won't get results no matter what you do, right? And so then you won't be a leader. There's 50 other definitions, and I realize nobody actually knows what leadership is. It's all over the map. And this is a problem because we say there's a leadership crisis in the world. We say there's a leadership crisis in this country, yet we really don't even know what it is. We know what we see in, in officials that we don't like. Uh, to me, leadership is the following. Leadership requires three things, and it's not about outcomes. Just because you get good outcomes does not mean you're a good leader. And by the way, if the outcomes are poor because the challenge is so great, you could be the world's greatest leader and have done a superb job. So I made a little note to myself. I wrote down the term 65. Most of you, to get in this, you must be good students, right? 65 at the college you are at is probably, what, a C or a D? OK. Sometimes 65 is an A. And if you want to remember anything from where you, where you leave here, 65 sometimes is an A, because the grade is a function of the difficulty of the challenge. 
And that's why, it, you know, this is, what you're about to do is graded on a curve, which is a function of how difficult it is. And for many of you, you are going to have to get comfortable with the fact that the 65 could be an A+. Plus. Certainly an A. And here's why. Leadership requires three things. And I'm going to talk about how you do this. Three things. First of all, can you figure out what you believe, what do you believe? What do you believe should be done in the situation you're about to get into? You're going to, you're going to be parachuted in, right? And you're going to assess the situation, and you're going to have to come up with a point of view on what you think should be done, like an owner, as if you were in charge, even though you may not be. Leaders don't always know what should be done, but leaders are always asking that question. What do I think should be done? Okay? What, what do I believe? What do I believe? What do I believe? What do I believe? And the reason that's hard is one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to analyze the context of where you're going. What's the culture of the country I'm in? Okay? Who are the people that I'm working with? What are the procedures that are going on here? What are, the, what, what are all the elements of the situation? You're going to have to analyze all that. I would call that the context. To figure out what you think should be done as a leader, you're going to have to ask, and in order to understand the context, text, you're going to have to learn to ask questions. A lot of people think that leaders are supposed to have the answers. Some of you may make the mistake of thinking that you're supposed to know what you're supposed to do when you get there, right? That people are expecting you to have answers. I would argue leadership is about asking the right questions. You, no one expects you to have the answers. And in fact, if you come in and act like you do, they know you don't. And they're going to think you're a lousy listener and they're going to think you don't understand them. And they're going to think maybe that you're arrogant. It is not a sign of weakness to say, I do not know. Get practice saying, I don't know. I changed my mind. I was wrong. I would like your advice. Learn to practice saying those things. Why? Because leaders have to figure out what they believe, and you cannot do it without asking questions and getting help from others. No one expects you to walk in with guns blazing and giving orders. And if you do that, you're going to have trouble, right? I think you know that. Now, eventually, there's a reason you're asking questions. It's with the purpose to figure out what you believe should be done. Okay? That's number one. Uh, there's lots of people in this world who have opinions, by the way. The television and radio is full of them. You, you should do this, they should do that, they should have done this, they should have done that. You will be surrounded by lots of people who have opinions. The problem is that isn't leadership. Leadership requires something much more. It requires you to put yourself in the shoes of the decision maker, of the owner, to pretend that anything you wanted to be done could be done, and think about what you believe should be done. You should be asking that question, okay? Second thing a leader does is, and by the way, I go through most of my life, I have no idea what should be done. I don't. So that's why I'm asking lots of questions, and I'm trying to understand the culture, of a company or a country. I lived in Asia, by the way, for five years. Most of the things that came out of my mouth were questions, had a question mark at the end, okay? Because I didn't know. I didn't even understand the language. I didn't understand what they were saying. They were all around me. I didn't even understand what they were saying. But you've got to figure out what you believe, and you've got to be asking questions, number one. Now, on those rare cases where you say, I think I know what should be done, then a leader does the second thing. A leader has the ability to act. That could be as simple as giving your opinion, speaking up. It could be more complicated. It could involve coming up with a game plan. 
you know, plan of action, which may involve explaining it to others, getting their feedback, getting buy-in, okay, so that you can do something. You and where you're going, will, you will not be able to act alone, I am quite certain. None of you will be able to act alone, and if you try to, or if you try to ram things from top down, you're going to have to get opinions, seek advice, bring people in, come up with an idea of what should be done, and then engage them this way in acting, all right? And there's a third thing that leadership requires. By the way, there's lots of people in this world who know what they believe, but cannot bring themselves to do anything. They're afraid they're gonna look stupid, they think they're gonna be wrong, they wanna, don't wanna upset people. Occasionally, you're gonna have to act, okay? Nobody has to see it, but you're gonna need to take action. Third thing, leadership is about adding value to others. And I can tell you, I worked on Wall Street for 23 years, I work with companies all the time. I work with, we've, we've started 61, or helped start 61 nonprofits, including this one at uh, Draper Richards Kaplan. I have not yet seen a successful leader or organization that did, that did not ultimately focus on how to add value to someone else. And I'm including business too. I've seen a lot of businesses fail because they did not focus on how to add value. And I've seen people make money, a lot of money for a short period of time, but not over a sustained period of time if they did not add value to someone else. So one of the things you're going to have to think about as you figure out what you believe and you get in the habit of learning to act with others is how do you add, how do you add value, okay? What needs to be done, what would add value to someone else? Not what's gonna make you look good or gonna get others to like you or not what's gonna get you your next job. The best advice I ever got in my career was my first year at Goldman Sachs and I've followed it ever since. Do a good job at the job you're doing right now. Figure out how to add value and do your best today. The future will take care of itself. And I thought, wow, that's weird advice. But I realized that's great advice because I know how to focus on doing a good job today. And I mean today, as you're sitting here in this offsite, do, just do a good job today. Do your best today. That's all you can do, just do your best today. Ask questions, learn, but, and every day just do your best with a focus on how to add value to others. The future will take care of itself. It may, it may address some of your worries, okay? By the way, what will make your family happiest? To see that you're living in the present, doing your best today. Don't worry so much about outcomes. Because whatever you think the outcomes ought to be, you're going to be wrong anyhow. Who knows? But you do have to figure out every single day, what do I believe should be done? Who am I going to talk to? Who can I get advice from? Who can I ask questions from? Who can I bring in, get advice? Change your mind if you think you're wrong, okay? Every day, try to see if you can do something, take an action, maybe as simple as helping a person who's struggling, and, and add value. If you do that every day, I do not know what the outcomes are gonna be from your summer, or your year, I should say, but I think, I think you're gonna get in the right place. Now, this is the headline. Here's the hard part. There are two things you've gotta do in order to accomplish those three things. You have to understand the situation. So when you get, in order to do this, you're gonna to have to become very good at understanding your situation. And because the situations you're in are very complicated, and I think very challenging, you need to learn, as I said, to ask questions and analyze the situation. Now, what are, what are all the things I'd be asking about to analyze the situation? The people, who are they? Who are the people you're working with? Get to know them, you know? Ask them a question. Tell them something about you. Tell them something about yourself. Share something about yourself. 
and ask them questions about them. That includes the people you're working with, but the people in the community you're serving. Get to understand them. Great, by the way, what's a relationship? Mutual understanding, mutual trust, and mutual respect. Asking someone a question that helps you understand them better shows them a lot of respect. People, what, how, does you, how do you fit in as an outsider, for those of you who are worried about that? Show respect to the people that, where you're going. Asking a question, saying, or asking for their advice, you may think you need to act like the big leader when you walk in, then they'll like you. No, no. Go in and ask their advice. They'll think you're pretty sharp, believe it or not. Learn to do that, and, so, and it will help you understand the people. Learn to ask a question of these people. Number two, um, the culture, which was related, you've got to understand the norms. Culture is a misunderstood word, but it means um, the structure. There are a lot of things you're going to have to understand. You have to understand the, what I would call the formal organization. How, how does the organization work that you're in? And how does the country work? How do things get done? What are the processes? How do things get done? But, you're gonna, but there's, a, there's something that you won't find written anywhere, and that's what is the culture. What are the norms? A norm is a should do. So what's a norm here? It sounds like a norm here is, uh, you know, you guys are very respectful. You sit here, you pay attention, you raise your hand. Somebody tell you to raise your hand before you talk? You, you applauded after the last session. Somebody tell you to do that? You must have read it somewhere, right? But it's a norm. Uh, and, and by the way, to an outsider who watches you high-fiving each other, some of your norms seem weird, right? <laughs> but it's the same thing where you're going. There are norms in your family. There's norms where you went to school. There will be norms where you go. They are unwritten, but you can observe them by why, why, are, why are you doing that? Why are you acting this way? And a lot of your questions are going to have to be about understanding the culture. People, you'll say, why did you just do that? Why do you eat dinner at that time? Why do you eat dinner in this way? Why do you gather in this way? Why, 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 why? Good, que good thing, why? Question mark. You're going to be asking that a lot. Okay? So leadership is about understanding the situation. And we're going to, I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're just going to talk and go to questions. It's about one other thing, a little more disturbing subject. And that's about, it's also about understanding you. So I am quite confident that all of you are smart enough and capable enough. You will learn to understand the situation. You can all learn to ask a question. Some of you may actually struggle with this more than you think, because you think you need that leadership is about having the answer. It's not. But you will learn to do all this, I think, with practice. And it will take you, my experience uh, is it will take you months, not weeks, to understand the people and the culture. I lived in Japan for five years. I go to dinner, I was at a dinner party Saturday night, and somebody was explaining to me that they'd visited Japan two or three times, and they're explaining to me way, the way the Japanese are. Oh, you know, they love to drink, and they love, and I'm thinking, oh God, this is so painful. And, and she said, you live there, what, what do you think? And I said, after living there five years, what I've learned, most significant thing I've learned, is I don't fully understand the Japanese culture. Nothing is as it seems. And that's after five years. Okay? You will never get it all figured out. And that's a good mindset to go in with. You need to be learning all the time. And people, that is an enormous sign of respect to the country you're going to, is learning about their culture. Because how many of you are Americans? And I'll say this as an American. Americans have a lousy reputation overseas. Why? Because there's a tendency, Americans say, the whole world must be like us. And so we have a bad habit of interpreting actions we see and say, these people must be dishonest, stupid, incompetent, blah, 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 when they're not. They're just different. And, and the, outside the, the rest of the world, will expect you as Americans, for those Westerners here, to take a Western culture and try to force it on them in the way you look at them. They will be wildly impressed 
if you do not do that. Shockingly impressed. Okay, but they're, because they're going to be waiting for you to do it. They're going to hope maybe secretly that you do it. <laughs> These will confirm all the, all the assumptions they had. If you learn to ask a question and try to understand them and adapt to them, that's going to impress the heck out of them. They're going to be shocked. So keep it in mind. I think you'll learn to do it. Okay, there is one other thing that will trip you up, though, and that is, unfortunately, that's, all, you don't, that's not overseas. That's sitting right here. And it's not Barbara or the people sitting on your right or your left. It's you. You will be, you will trip you up. Okay? Here's what I mean. Do you understand yourself? Now, there's the easy stuff, although it's not so easy. Do you understand your strengths and weaknesses? Do, can you write down on a piece of paper, you know, your own strengths and weaknesses? Why does that matter? Is because you're going to need help. Some of the things you go there, you're going to have to admit to people, I'm not very good at X. You may think you're not supposed to do that because you're supposed to be the big leader, right, coming in, not supposed to do that. That's what leaders do, by the way. Leaders have to understand themselves, know your strengths, and acknowledge your weaknesses and try to learn about them and get help with them. Your job is not to be great at everything because you won't be, but it is to be aware. So I would say to you, if you can write down your strengths and weaknesses before you go during this next two weeks, that would be a good start. Okay? It's no shame to have a weakness. But forget that. All of you have weaknesses. I'm sorry. You do. Okay? And so part of understanding yourself is just saying, okay, I'm better at this than that. Understanding your passions, meaning what do you love to do and what do you hate to do? And one question I'd ask you is when do you shine? When have you shined in your life? You know what I mean by shined? When did you get in a situation where you were great? All of you, in order to get here, must have had some time in your life where it, you were great. Recall that situation. What do you learn about yourself? What kind of environment do you like? What are you good at? What are you not good at? You know, what makes you thrive? Keep it in mind. Okay, it might help you there. It also might help you understand why you're having a hard time where you're going. Okay, now here's the big one, which Barbara loves, and so I will talk about it. And that is the other big one. So there's your values, which you guys just talked about. I would call this your story, okay? Your life story. I would argue that many of the fears that you all talked about here are a function of, for many of you, something that already has happened to you in your life. Your life story. Okay, so let, this is one we're gonna talk about for a minute. And then I'm gonna stop and we're gonna take questions. You have three stories, each of you. You may not realize this, but you have three stories. You have the facts, that's one story. I was, born, I was born in Kansas City, I went to University of Kansas, my father was a traveling salesman, my mother's a real estate agent, they came from New York, you know, I worked two years in Kansas, this is my story, two years in Kansas City, I went to Harvard Business School, I just lay out the facts, okay? Now for some people, even this is a problem, because the minute you get to, well, write down about your parents, they say, that's far enough because they had some traumatic experience with their parents, they don't want to talk about their parents. Okay, but if you can, just write down the facts chron chronologically from when you were born to today of your life story. Now you may say, this is a stupid thing to do, I already know my own story. Well, here's what you'll find. If you write down the facts, you may have forgotten some things, uh, and it may give you some insight. And here's the reason, by the way, we're going through these three stories. It's not because it's so great to get your story down. It's to understand why you do what you do now. Okay? Who you are now. So, anyhow, story number one is the facts. Story number two, I actually don't care whether you write down or not. Story number two, because you've got so much practice at this one, I don't need to give you more. The story number two I would call the success narrative. It takes the facts and it weaves them into a beautiful story 
about you. This is the story that you tell in your application to get in here. This is the story you tell at cocktail parties when you're trying to make a good impression, when you're going for a job, which is most of the time. Uh, it's the story that you're trying to um, uh, tell in a job interview. Your profile, we never had a profile, your profile on Facebook, you know, all that stuff, that's putting a nice face on, I'm a this. You're labeling yourself. Okay, so when you go and tell your success story, it's a, it, a lot of you are so good, you're really good at it, and you'll get better at it, but you, and some people come in and train people to tell it even better, I'm not interested in that. Uh, but it, you, you, you might have had setbacks in your life. For many of you, you'd say, I went through a terrible hardship, and it was very traumatic, and I lost confidence in myself, and I didn't know if I would make it through. But then, then I gathered myself, and I decided, no, I will not be held back, and I will go. And then I went, and that's how I wound up here. OK. And a lot of you, you're so good at this, and you weave it, and you get better and better and better, and maybe you get so good that you know you have a friend of yours or someone in your family is with you when you're telling it, and they say, that never happened. And, uh, <laughs> and you go, shut up. OK, so that's, that's the second story. So then there's this, th I'm getting to the story that I'm interested in, because this gets to your fears, the third story. This is the one I want. This is a story you're not writing down. You're not putting on any application. You're not telling it at any cocktail party. It is not on your profile, in your profile. And it's a story you may not be telling anyone, but you got it big time. Now, you may, some of you may be saying, gee, it's a good thing I don't have that. But the truth is, everyone in this room, including me, has a big one. And the smarter you are, and the better your grades, and the more accomplished, my experience is, the bigger the failure, I call this the failure narrative. I'm not good enough narrative. This is a story that is rattling around in your head, OK? And the nice thing about this get-together is it seems like the norms are here. It's OK to share what you're scared of. But when you're going, you may be afraid to share it, OK? So I, this is a story I would like you to write. And this is a story, and only you know this story. You can write it in invisible ink if you like. But this is a story that basically takes the facts of your life and says, you know, I wasn't accepted here. They hated me. I failed. I had a traumatic experience maybe with, a, with an adult figure. Um, I, I've been in a challenging situation before, and, I, and people betrayed me. Or I did a good job, but I was misjudged, and I was treated like I didn't do a good job. Or, I did a good job, but the results were terrible, and then I felt bad. And you got those? And a lot of your fears come from that failure narrative. It actually, you would think it's about the situation you're about to go into. Your fears, and my fears, I got a lot of fears, I, trust me. That's why I have two older sisters, and they get a lot of, you know, on the telephone talking to them about it, and friends of mine. They're about you. And the only thing I want you to do before you go into a very stressful situation you're about to and challenging is you want to separate what's bugging you into two columns. The situation is challenging. OK? That could be bugging you. So you got to ask questions. You've got to learn about it. But the other thing that could be bugging you is you, in that you, have, uh, you don't think you're good enough before you even got to your next assignment. You may think that people don't like you. You may have some self-doubt about something. And everyone in this room has got it. And you bring that with you. And you might even project it on the people you're about to meet. You haven't even met them yet. You're projecting. Here's an example. Uh, I trusted someone in the past. They betrayed me. People can't be trusted. So I'm going to be very guarded. Or. I betrayed someone else in the past. I did something really stupid. I, hope I was supposed to keep my mouth shut. I betrayed them. Maybe I can't be trusted. That's crazy that some of you might think that. Or you think you're just not good enough. 
I'd like you, and we're going to take a few minutes now, write down on a piece of paper a little bit, just a few lines about your failure narrative. Your failure narrative. Your story. I failed. I'm not good enough. I don't think I can do this. I'm afraid that the results aren't going to be there. I fear because, but relate it to something that happened in your life. Connect that fear you have that we all got put out to an event. Can you connect it to something in your story, a narrative in your head? You with me? Take a stab at it. Barbara wants me to write and tell you a bit about mine. So, so I'll just give you a lot. You know, I was an awkward kid in that I used to sweat a lot. And, and my father used to say, it's healthy, it's good to sweat. But it didn't feel very good, like you go to a party and there are girls, and I'm sweating, like, and, and, I'm, and it's very embarrassing. Secondly, my parents, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, and my dad was a traveling salesman, and we're always living on the verge of disaster. So they used to buy clothes two and three years in advance, thinking I was going to grow into them. Well, eventually I did stop growing. So my clothes were like three times too big, and people would say, there's Bozo the Clown, you know, because my clothes all looked weird, and I sweat a lot. So I actually felt very uh, awkward in high school, or junior high in particular was the worst, where I just felt like I didn't fit. And uh, very thin skin, kids made fun of me about what I was wearing, and it really freaked me out. And it stayed with me to, to today, to my whole life. So if I get in a situation where I think people, I feel awkward, or I said something stupid, or you know, I'm not accepted, I'm sure I think back to when I was sweating a lot, and, and the clothes were too big and they didn't fit, and kids were making fun of me, and it was like, oh my God, not again. So I will go to great lengths to avoid that kind of situation. And I have very short trigger, probably, in feeling weird about that kind of situation. Now, what does that manifest itself in today? I'm a professor at Harvard, okay? Everybody might think that's great. I think there's a merger boom going on in the world. Maybe I should go back there. I go to New York City, people say to me, why aren't you back here? You should be, you should be running an investment bank right now. And I think, oh, they're right, they're right. Oh my God, I shouldn't be, I should be back out doing this because maybe I'm not good enough and I feel weird. And I've got to catch myself and say, that has nothing to do with the situation. That is my, that is my I won't say the word, but that's my bull, whatever. That's my shtick. That's my thing. That's my problem. I got inferiority complex. Even though I've outgrown it and everybody says, oh my God, not you. You're, like Barbara says to me, you? You have a failure narrative? Right? Barbara's sitting there on the side saying, you? No. No, you couldn't. You're, you're so confident. No, I'm not. I come across like I am. Many of you do too, but I got a searing, you know, anxiety, and you ever feel anxiety? Any of you have anxi feelings of anxiety like chainsaw? Uh, uh, okay. So that, that's, if that's intended to warm you up. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back mainly because I know there wasn't enough time, but I want to get you, I, I want to get you warmed up on this. I guess what I want to ask is, by telling this story or hearing from the person next to you, What'd you learn? Not about the story. What did you learn about doing this? What'd you learn about you? What have you learned about you? Yeah. I think that sh sharing these stories kind of makes us have a deeper connection almost. So like sharing your fears makes you more of a friend of the person you shared them with. And how did it make you feel to share it? Uh, good. It's good talking about it, I think. It's a little weird. <laughs> it brings up memories, but I think that that is the point of doing this exercise, maybe. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, not so good. I, you just said good. My, I don't know, I'm still like, huh. <laughs> I just told people that. <laughs> so what's the worry that you disclose something you wish you hadn't told? No, I think it's something that I just don't like to think about it a lot. Dred dredged it up. Yep. Okay. So, by the way, for each of you, as you think about that, uh, this exercise is not intended to get rid of the failure narrative, but I'll tell you what it is intended to do. I want you to think about or write down on a piece of paper, how does this narrative, even if it's been submerged and you say, I don't want to think about it, how's it affecting your behavior 
now. That's what I'm interested in. Because you're about to head into a challenging, and it is going to be difficult. 65 is going to be an A. You're going to have to readjust, adapt. It's going to be difficult, challenging in many ways. And your self-doubt is going to be more likely to come to the fore. And what you want to be able to understand is if you're feeling lousy one day, is it something you actually did that day? Is it the situation? Or is it just basically because it's dredging up something in the past and you're doing a great job? Even though you feel lousy, you might be doing a fantastic job and this is just something about you you have to u get used to dealing with. You with me? And so, and by the way, if it's the first time you've done it, and by the way you deal with it is just say, I don't want to think about it. Here's the, here's the issue, which is true for most of us. It always comes to the fore. And by the way, here, as, a, as an executive, I can tell you, everyone around me or everybody at Draper Richards Kaplan knows there's something weird about me. Okay, and I laugh, but they know there's something weird about you too. And because of some of the weird things you do. And, and they're wondering, why does he do that? And you know, when I see that, I said, there must be quite a story. And there is, in my case, there is a story behind it. And if I'm aware of why I'm doing what I'm doing, I can manage it a little better. Because it's going to come up in my actions, whether I'm aware of it or not. So it's better if you have a little awareness of it. OK, what else did you learn? Yes. Because you feel like, in other words, you heard it and you have it too. My experience actually is the more success, more, more, the more you are a straight A student, okay, the more you never fail, the more it's always been you're going to feel this way, because normal people, pardon me for saying. Don't get, I got straight A's in college. Normal people don't get straight A's. You must have something really, either you're, yes, you're super smart, but in order for most of us to do the work to get all A's, you got something really bugging you, okay? <laughs> Some weird. Now, the other thing is you will eventually experience failure or not being the best. And how you, I, it's not if that happens, it's when that happens. You will struggle. You just will. I'm not interested in preventing that. I am interested in how you deal with it when it happens. And the thing to do is go back and understand yourself. What are my strengths and weaknesses? What kind of environment do I shine in? What is my story? And let's not go crazy here. You know, let's just keep an even keel and just adjust to it. This was going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. And so it's going to happen in this one year assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, during the during the narr the uh, interview process, the application process, we had a we both had a moment where we were worried that we were only in this that position because we knew somebody because of networking. Right. And so, um, <laughs> we so it kind of felt like it was a. Dis you must really both be well connected, I guess. <laughs> no. <laughs> No. So this is the most connected group of 123 on the planet. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we also realize that networking is like a, a lot of how the way the world works. And so, you know, that kind of how do you balance feeling like on the one hand that's how the world works and not discrediting So here's what yourself. I'm interested in. How many of you here feel like imposters? Okay. So my question is not whether or not you're an imposter, because I, I don't think, I think you're going to have to accept you're not. The question is, why? What is it about, not about, forget global, this has, you're feeling like an imposter has nothing to do with Global Health Corps. I hate to break it to you. Nothing. Zero. Nothing to do with the process or how you networked or how you got in here. It has something to do with you. So the thing I'd like you to think about over this next week or two, what is it about you that makes you go there. Now, there's a, some of you have a different problem. I mean, if they didn't get the, you didn't get the assignment, I should have. I was the best one. I'm better than everyone there. That's another problem. But for others of you, it's like, I can't believe they picked me. There must have been, I must have 
I wonder if my, I had a friend who did something I wasn't even aware. Why do you do that? I don't know the answer, but I want you to think about why. Because I'm sure you got here on the merits, but you're going to get into other situations in your life and just understand why you go, why do you go there? Why do you, you know, it take, it not, don't have to say to the group, but think about why you go there. And for the rest of you, why do you go there? There's something in your story. Just be aware of it, okay? Let's hear what, what'd you learn? Let's, if somebody's got a microphone. Sorry, um, I, I was just following up on the question where you asked um, why one would feel like an imposter. Yeah, okay, had, why is that? I had an opinion and it was that, you know, when you look, it might not exactly be about me as an individual, it might be about when you look at the range of individuals, when you read the profiles, you sort of get the feeling that they are in the right place and you're not. And would it shock you to think that they hear you? I watched you come up and speak earlier in the pre uh, you in the previous exercise, right? You got up and spoke about Sinbad, <laughs> right? And I said to Barbara, "Wow, that guy is really impressive." Did I not? Okay, so they're pro I, I was sit I, they're probably sitting there watching you speak and saying, "God, I wonder how I got in here because that guy is really impressive." Yeah, but it's a universal feeling, so you kind of feel, so is, on an why? individual level, you feel like you're a fraud. And then the question is, why? Because of the profiles of the... Yeah. <laughs> I got to break it to you. It's not the profiles of the people here. I know you think it is. It's not... I, well, here's a question. Is it the situation, uh, the situation would be these are just great people, or is there something about you or your life experience or what you saw in your parents or others when people, I mean, you won the lottery here or whatever, you got this. Maybe you've seen other people that you thought deserved to win in the past and they didn't and they were treated unfairly. And maybe you're thinking, you're conditioned to think, I won. That's not supposed to happen. I'm not supposed to win. Nobody ever wins. Good people, merit doesn't matter, right? Or you know what? I, I shouldn't have won. Maybe it has something to do with your life experience or what you've seen in the country you came from or with people you love. Is that possible? Yeah, so try to just be more aware of it. It's not these people. It's something you're bringing. But it's, na it's a natural, by the way, we deal with this, I deal with this at Harvard Business School all the time. People are freaked out because half of them don't think they belong there. Uh, but it's, it, including me, um, by the way. <laughs> All right, let's go one other, then I'm going to make one last comment, and we're going to stop. I'll go. I'm right here. Um, <laughs> right here. Um, I think another thing, and this is just based off of my experiences and people that I've talked to, but we, when you look around, it's like, who is the person that always gets celebrated for doing something? You look at that person, they're probably the most vocal person. And if you are an introvert, you don't generally get celebrated, even though behind the scenes you're doing the great work. And for me, that's something that I struggled with in school, in grad school, in the different teamwork dynamics that I've been a part of. I'm generally the person who's quiet, I process things, and when I think I have something powerful to give in, I open my mouth and say something. But for some time I thought, that's not what a leader is supposed to be. And so I tried to be like the vocal person, but it felt awkward because that's not who I am inside. And so, so you know, it. when you're young, and you're seeing the person that's applauded in the classroom, you kind of start to sit back, and I think that's what makes us believe so all these things. I have a little things. secret to let you in on. Okay, you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, when someone gets up and is compelling, right? Like we just saw, I thought everyone, almost everyone I heard speak in the previous, they were, they're pretty darn compelling. Either you've had a knack for picking very, and if you had gotten up and speak, spoke, you may not think so, you would have been compelling, okay? If you, you, why? I did. Yeah, then I heard you. If you talked about what you believe, if you go to what you truly believe, I mean, we have a president of the United States who I like a lot, I voted for twice, I'll say it, who is a very good speaker, but a lot of time I hear him speak, I don't find him compelling, even though he's smooth, not compelling. Why? Because I'm not sure I feel like he's talking about every time what he believes. 
I, lo I like them, by the way, so I'm saying this, but I've just observed that. You can be boring, dull, lack charisma, introvert, all those things. I assure you, you get up there, and I've dealt with this my whole life in business. You take somebody who's the boring, 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 dull, 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 get them to talk about something they believe in, zzz, inspiring. That's the secret. So think about what you believe. What resonates with you? I used to be afraid to speak in front of large groups. Uh, and unfortunately, the thing that cured me, which was a terrible thing to go, was the, I'd do the eulogy for my father. Terrible. I mean, horrible situation. Died suddenly and I'd do the eulogy. And I was afraid to speak in front of a group. I thought it was my worst nightmare, okay? But I talked about what I believed and it finally hit me after all these years of struggling, that if you talk about what you believe, you can be a heck of a speaker and very charismatic and all that stuff that I don't think I am. And so you've got it. Yeah. Well, see, so that's the key. That's what, that's what, makes, a, that's what makes leaders. So if no one believes, the question was, what if you believe something no one else believes? Here's my advice, happens all the time to me. I'll sit in a meeting and everybody's high-fiving over something, and I think the thing they're high-fiving over is terrible. So then I have to decide how big a jerk do I want to be? <laughs> and I'll say, either I, sorry, I don't understand, okay? Turns out no one in the room understood, okay? <laughs> here's, here's the thing, if you believe something and you're damn sure of it and everybody believe, disagrees with you, it's possible you're wrong, by the way, or it's possible you need to ask more questions. So that happens all the time. This is why you're always asking questions, getting advice, seeking other opinion, listening to their arguments, you know what I mean? And maybe they'll change your mind. I was wrong, I changed my mind. But if you still are pretty firm after asking all those questions and getting other views, and you still believe it, there's something there. And you are adding value, in my opinion, to give your view. Even if the group says, thank you very much, but that's not what we're gonna do, you're still adding a lot of value, because I assure you, you're on to something, okay? Now, one last comment, and then I'll stop. You're gonna need relationships where you're going to process all this stuff. To figure out the situation, to understand yourself, you can't do this alone. You, where you're going, it's very complex, it's complex. So, what's a relationship, I said this earlier? Mutual trust, mutual understanding, mutual respect. That's a relationship. I did not say affection. You don't need to like somebody to have a relationship with them. Okay, everybody goes to, but I don't like them. But yet, when you're having a problem, you may find you can't talk to any of those people you like because you don't trust them, you don't respect them, or they don't understand you as well as you, as you might like. So I, I would argue you need to cultivate people, and here's how you develop these three things. Tell, them, tell people something about yourself, okay? Share something, like you just did. You just went, took a big step in developing a relationship with the person you just talked to by sharing something with them. That's a big deal. Shows a lot of respect, helps them understand you better, builds trust. Where you're going, for those of you who worried you won't be accepted, you won't get enough done, you won't be able to bring people in, tell them something about yourself. Tell them you're worried about something. Share with them where you're coming from, okay? Second, learn to ask a question of them that will help you to understand them better, okay? Ask them what they're worrying about, you know? Say, what's keeping you up at night? What's your biggest worry? What's your biggest challenge in your life? Ask a question that would allow them to share something. 